right. Um, so as I said, my name is Aisha Diakita Kotleva, and um, today we will address the topic mimicking daylight indoors. The why, explaining uh, why we need good light inside, um, the ben benefits of um, light, um, the what, uh, what is good light, and how to design for it. I would like, before we start with the presentations, I would like to acknowledge um, the partner organizations, um, so the Good Light Group, the Daylight Academy, the International Association of Lighting Designers, um, the Society for Light uh, Treatment and Biological Rhythm, and um, the Luga um, Research um, that kindly also is managing the technical part today. Um, as uh, some of you know, today is the International Day for Light, um, and uh, we are very proud to be part of the of UNESCO's effort to raise awareness um, about light. Um, shortly about the agenda for today, um, we will start with the introduction, which is happening now, and um, then we will go on to the first lecture from Yvonne de Court on daylight, see me, feel me, touch me, heal me. Um, to then uh, go to the second um, talk of the day, um, daylight in buildings, how much we need and get by Johannes Zauner. And last but not least, we will have a panel discussion um, on um, daylight insight, um, which will be joined by Kai Brosio. Um, at the end, I would um, ask um, you to stay with us and take part in the um, in a short event survey to help us um, improve for the next meetings. Uh, and um, it's just it will take a minute um, for your um, feedback. Shortly about the housekeeping rules, um, you are all muted, um, but there is a Q&A Zoom tool where you can ask your questions and all of the questions, or most of the questions at least, uh, will be addressed in the panel discussion at the end. So shortly um, about me, um, as said, I'm Aisha Dekita Kodleva. Um, I work at the Technical University uh, of Berlin as a lecturer, and I'm a guest um, professor at the Freie University of Brussels. And I would like to shortly introduce all um, the talkers, uh, so all the presenters, um, Yvonne and uh, Johannes, and then also shortly um, uh, say a few words about Kai, and then we will start with the first presentation. So Yvonne de Cord is a full professor and chair of the Environmental Psychology of Human Technology Interaction in the Department of uh, Industrial Engineering and Innovation Science at uh, the Technical University Eindhoven. And with her group, she's investigating the effects of uh, lighting conditions on human, um, specifically targeting light effects um, for day active people in real world conditions. Um, for both the visual effects and the non-image forming effects. And um, additionally, she's also studying with her group the restorative effects of light and nature scene, uh, which I hope she will present also today. Um, as some of you know, um, Yvonne is also leading um, the effort of the European project uh, on training network and training emerging uh, scientists. Um, the project is called LightCap. Today, um, Yvonne will address in this main topic, mimicking daylight indoors, the why and the what. Um, she will provide um, scientific evidence for the importance of daylight and sunlight indoors for human health and well-being um, and um, guide us through the different mechanisms um, that um, through which these effects emerge or may emerge uh, with the hope that um, she will inspire architects and engineers to design even better daylight access. The second um, uh, talk will be um, given by Johannes Zauner, who is a researcher and lecturer at the Munich University of Applied Science. Uh, he has completed his PhD in human biology. Uh, by training, he's an architect, uh, and he works also as a freelance planner in projects that um, address energy efficiency, efficient buildings, daylighting, and ele electric lighting. Um, as a freelance partner of the office uh, light design and engineering firm Tree LPI, he incorporates his um, uh, studies also into planning practice. Um, and he is also very active on the national level in Germany uh, in uh, scientific committees um, uh, within the German Lighting Technology Society, Elite Gear. 
Um, today, Johannes will um, have a lecture about daylight in buildings, how much uh, we need and get. And in this, um, he will address the what and how. Um, so he will showcase the uh, real world projects that successfully optimize daylight levels during the design phases um, or the design phase and integrate electric lighting to boost light levels during winter. And he will give us uh, insight in why a quantitative daylight optimization at the very beginning of a project uh, not only saves money, but also, of course, leads to uh, better interior spaces. And then last but not least, uh, we will be joined um, in the panel discussion by my dear colleague from the TU Berlin, um, Kai Brosho, who is completing his uh, PhD on um, the direction of light incidence on human visual effects of light um, um, on humans. He is at the, at the moment a uh, research associate at the German Federal Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. And he's also very active uh, in, um, in um, um, yeah, let's say, um, committees um, such as national and international, such as the CIE, DIN, um, and the German um, Lighting Technology Society. He's also a lecturer at the University of Applied Science in Berlin, the HTV. So with that, I would like to... Um, give the floor to uh, Yvonne with the first um, lecture. Hello, Yvonne. Hi, great to Hi. see you. Nice to start see my you. screen. The floor is all yours. Uh, yes. So um, before I started investigating light some 15 years ago, I was uh, working as an environmental psychologist studying uh, restorative effects. These are aspects of nature um, that uh, have a very positive effect on our functioning. In fact, it's, uh, from a lot of research, we have learned um, that um, spending time in nature or looking at nature can help us restore from stress, can help us uh, strengthen our men mental health, our physical health. Um, it can impro uh, improve our, um, uh, intent our attention and it can replenish depleted resources. And these are called restorative effects of nature. I hope the sound is better now. So um, if we look at this literature, then um, we're still a little bit unclear about what the exact effects are beneath, behind these, uh, these restorative effects. Um, but there are a few uh, important theories and uh, uh, the, called ART and SRT. So ART has more of a cognitive um, uh, inspiration and says that because we have to direct our attention the entire day, uh, this um, uh, resource to, to direct attention becomes depleted. And what we really need is then something to just take our mind off, um, uh, to fascinate us so that it grabs our attention automatically and we can ba basically restore our capacity to direct attention while we're looking at nature. And uh, so this is a theory that's uh, been uh, developed by uh, uh, Rachel and Stephen Kaplan. And uh, they say that nature has this quality because it's inherently, inherently fascinating. It's, it's complex, it's rich, and at the same time, it's coherent and you can understand it. Um, uh, so, so this is one of the theories behind why uh, nature is so good for us. Um, but there's also a different theory um, uh, developed by Ulrich um, and he says that there may be an evolutionary, uh, or there may have been an evolutionary advantage in responding automatically positively to nature that is safe, because we evolved in nature with both um, dangerous, but also with, with uh, uh, non-threatening uh, nature, with, uh, with uh, water, with cover for us, uh, with um, uh, plants uh, to eat, uh, perhaps. And uh, so he says that because of this, evolutionary um, uh, advantage for responding positively to nature. We now have in our DNA uh, this, this uh, um, automatic response to nature with positive effects, if it's non-threatening, of course, if it's uh, a positive effect, and also our physiology will uh, be lower, um, or at least if it's too high, it will restore to a lower level when we look at nature. Now, we're still debating in the, in the domain which of those theories is the correct one, but actually both will predict that if we look at nature or 
spend time in nature, that our heart rate will go down, that our uh, negative effect will be less, that our positive effect will be more positive. And in fact, there's also quite a bit of literature to support these claims. So just a, a, a few examples from a, from a big uh, literature. Um, there are studies that have shown that indeed, um, if you uh, induce stress and you uh, then show people uh, images of nature versus of urban scenes, for instance, they will report lower stress when they look at nature images. They will also report improved mood, so better, more positive effects, lesser negative effects. Um, if you induce stress and measure the physiological responses, for instance, heart rate variability or blood pressure, you will see that people restore faster while they are looking at nature scenes uh, versus uh, urban scenes. And uh, we often show better cognitive performance, so we're better at attention tasks or um, uh, uh, working memory tasks uh, when uh, after we've looked at nature. And uh, it's even been shown that we may recover faster after surgery um, if our hospital room is looking out on nature rather than at, for instance, a brick wall. And this is a famous study of uh, Roger Ulrich, one of the founders of this uh, domain. There are, if you're interested, there are lots of uh, reviews in this uh, domain uh, that you can check out. Now, of course, um, the bridge from nature, from nature to natural light is quite uh, uh, intuitive because, of course, daylight is also a natural phenomenon, a natural element. And um, uh, although research into the more psychological effects of light and daylight is, is still quite limited, there are, of course, quite a number of indications that daylight is uh, being perceived positively. In fact, um, uh, many uh, studies have shown that we show a consistent reference for, for instance, windows uh, and daylight, especially when we're indoors. And of course, we know that daylight in and of itself has a wonderful spectrum, has a high uh, illuminance level, it is there at the right time. Um, but also daylight is um, psychologically associated with nature. So when we see daylight and when we see uh, skylight, um, we think of nature, of outdoors, and these all induce positive emotions, positive effect. Um, daylight is also associated with naturalness, and people will automatically, in principle, in most cases, uh, judge more natural elements and phenomena more positive than those that are man-made or chemical. Um, and uh, uh, of course, as I said, there's a large literature uh, indicating that uh, spending time in nature or looking at nature is, is good for you. But in many of those cases, this exposure to nature would have gone hand in hand, basically, with daylight. Um, so if you're outdoors, you're also experiencing daylight. So maybe some of those effects have already been um, uh, installed by daylight rather than, for instance, the greenery, the plants or the, or the animals. So we started to wonder, could natural light also have those restorative effects? Maybe it, it could daylight indoors also uh, help us restore from stress, help us restore our attention um, and, uh, and, and give us more positive effect. Um, now, uh, so there are a few instances that do suggest that this is the case. There are field studies that have demonstrated um, very positive effects of sunlight, for instance, on the recovery from depression and people uh, being able to leave the clinic earlier. Um, these are famous studies by Boschman and Hayes, for instance, but also Canales. Um, in the uh, domain of uh, seasonal affective disorder, um, Anavius Justice have, has shown that a daily walk is very beneficial for persons with SAD and actually just as effective as sitting in front of a, a, a big uh, therapy lamp. And uh, there are a, a number of field studies uh, with ambulatory light logging. So they're logging light exposure all the time that show that uh, people who are exposed to more light um, will uh, show uh, lower symptoms of, of seasonal affective disorder and will also report higher vitality. So of course, with these daily walks and with these field studies, it's really hard to, again, tease apart whether this has been nature at play or whether this was daylight, so natural light at play. So uh, a couple of years ago, we designed a study that tried to tease these two apart. Um, we uh, performed uh, an experience sampling uh, study, or you could also call it ecological momentary assessment. So basically, we monitored people um, uh, for, uh, for uh, uh, quite a while, and we used uh, their telephones to, uh, to monitor their mood settings. 
and we use wearable light sensors to track uh, 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 their light. Oh, sorry, in, in this case, we didn't have a light sensor, we had a questionnaire. Um, so these studies are basically following people in their natural, uh, in their everyday lives. So it has very high ecological validity. It is in real life, it's in the real world. Um, they go about their normal business. Um, there's, of course, a lot of chaos also involved. Uh, so, of course, uh, a lot of other things happening. But still, if you track people for a bit longer, you can see structural patterns in the data. And what we wanted to see was whether these positive effects of nature and also those positive effects of daylight um, would be equally um, present in people who are uh, mentally healthy and those who are um, suffering from uh, some psychiatric symptoms. So we included two groups in this particular study. Um, we had a, a health group and a clinical group. And if you can see uh, uh, in, in this, as you can see in this table, um, scores on the back depression index and on the uh, depression and anxiety subscales um, are substantially higher for uh, the clinical group than the, than the non-clinical group. Uh, so we included all these um, uh, all these persons in a in an in a study where we followed them for six days, and every day they would get eight notifications, uh, somewhere between eight and ten in the evening. And uh, when they got a notification, they would uh, report on their uh, environment where they were. So they had a checklist uh, through which we measured how much nature they were exposed to and how much daily light they were exposed to at that moment. And they also report their mood. So they reported their valence in their mood, the hydronic tones so of positive and negative, um, how tensed and how energetic they felt. And they reported on objective stress, rumination, and psychosomatic complaints, so headaches, uh, neck uh, pain, etc. <clears throat> so um, when we looked at the data, we clearly saw that both of, uh, nature and daylight, uh, independently of each other, um, uh, induced higher vitality. So people reported more vitality when they were in uh, environments with more nature, but also when they were in environments with more daylight. And these existed next to each other. Um, we also saw positive effects of both nature and daylight on uh, affect, so on their emotions and on tension. So, and um, uh, persons with uh, clinical symptoms, so those with more um, depression uh, symptoms or more anxiety symptoms, uh, responded more strongly to those nature uh, uh, elements, but both groups responded equally positive to the daylight components. So how the more daylight there was, the more positive effect everyone reported and the more uh, the less tension everyone reported. Um, we also saw that uh, the more daylight there was, the less stress people reported. And um, uh, there was a non-significant, but still a trend for less rumination and fewer psychosomatic complaints, uh, and again, more so in the clinical example. So um, what we learned from this is that both nature and natural light next to each other, so they complement each other in contributing to a person's well-being in terms of their um, uh, emotional health, their affect, um, but also in terms of their stress and physiological health. Um, and uh, what we also felt was this uh, effect of, of daylight may go beyond the mere um, illuminance effect of light because uh, uh, we got the impression that outdoor light, daylight, so, so, so also being outdoors, um, had this effect stronger. But of course, again, it's a little bit difficult to, to tease these two apart. So uh, very recently, we started doing a systematic review. And um, in this systematic review, we focused particularly on daylight indoors. And uh, we wondered if daylight indoors uh, shows restorative effects. And we, for this, we went uh, in a systematic way through the literature. Um, so we have, uh, uh, we selected based on a lot of keywords, over 2000 records uh, from databases, from scientific databases and uh, with some strict rules on what to include and what to exclude. So for instance, they all had to be indoor studies. Um, we did not want any con confounds between daylight and a view to the outside. So that excluded quite a few uh, studies because we, we really wanted to be sure that we were this time only looking at daylight effects and not at effects of nature outdoors. 
Um, and uh, we decided to include a broad range of both restorative outcomes. So this would include both affective measures, cognitive measures, physiological measures, and even some clinical outcomes. So we had a, a, a a selection scheme uh, depicted here. I have to, by the way, warn you that this is still preliminary findings. We're taking the last text and then we're submitting this uh, for a paper. So please do not cite from this just yet. Uh, if you want to use this, be a little bit patient and, and call us later. Um, so um, this is quite a, 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 an effort uh, that we did here. And in the end, we uh, were left with 34 records of 32 different studies. Um, that tested effects of daylight or daylight influencing factors on one of those restorative outcomes. Um, so those daylight factors, uh, uh, we wanted to only include studies that had uh, an experimental uh, manipulation or a natural manipulation, a variation in the availability of daylight, whether it was present or not, or other factors um, affecting it. So these are the lists. This is the list of, of those uh, factors. So one is the presence of an opening. Is there a window, yes or no? Um, other studies tested whether there was a difference between um, uh, rooms facing east versus west or southeast versus northwest, So, uh, which influences, of course, how much sunlight they get, how much direct sunlight they get. We looked at studies which manipulated opening characteristics, for instance, with shading devices, or with, as you see here, depicted uh, facade design. Um, we selected um, a number of studies uh, where the position of the occupant was varied in a structural way, so from very close to the window to far from the window, or close to a sun patch, far from a sun patch. Um, and then there were a few studies. Uh, you can see on the right here how many studies of each uh, were included in the, in the review which um, uh, looked at variations between uh, sky conditions, so clouded versus sunny, and sun position, but whether it was high in the sky or low in the sky. As I said, we included empirical studies that reported some, one of, of the uh, outcome measures that were, we thought were uh, relevant here, so cognitive, affective, physiological, or clinical restoration. Just to give you a little taste of what sort of studies were in there, um, we had 50% uh, uh, basically was in more healthcare context, 50% was more in office context, and uh, naturally we also had then uh, uh, quite a few studies with patients, uh, a few with nurses, that uh, explains the difference there, um, but also a lot of studies with healthy people. And um, uh, outcome variables uh, were quite nicely uh, divided over the, the four categories that we had. If you see here cognitive, we had attention test, perception or memory test, and higher order cognitive skills. We had in the terms of affective measures, mood measures, emotion measures, and affective arousal measures, physiological arousal measures, like uh, heart rate and blood pressure, length of stay in a hospital or clinic, for instance, and medication usage. And uh, this graph, in one glance shows you the outcomes of the study. Um, I'll take you through it in more detail, but uh, as a first indicator, the green parts refer to studies that showed a positive effect of more daylight, being closer to daylight or more sunlight. Um, the gray ones indicate that there was no significant effect found, not negative, but also not positive. Um, the red ones indicate a negative effect of more light, and the blue ones indicate an effect of light, but there is no uh, the amount of light, for instance, was the same, so there was no good or bad of light. It was basically the shape or form that the light intervention took that matters. So to go a little bit more in detail, this is a, a total, but I'll not take you through it in more detail. So the first the two classes of studies that manipulated presence of an opening or orientation of an opening actually show very consistent positive effects of more daylight and, uh, and, and being on the sunny side of a building. And these include affective outcomes, physiological outcomes, and even clinical outcomes. And uh, um, so, so in these clinical outcomes, there was even one that showed an, a, a neutral, so a non-significant effect, but did uh, show um, uh, that the incidence of delirium, for instance, decreased, which was not one of our outcome measures, but still, I think it's very relevant to report this. So again, overall, quite strong evidence for healthful restorative effects of daylight indoors. And these were 
Um, a lot of these were in healthcare context, but there were also a number of them in office context. Um, so what could be the underlying mechanism of these restorative effects? And of course, as I said, um, in this domain, we talk a lot about those non-image forming and I, uh, IPRGC influenced effects. Um, uh, uh, as I said, daylight is in and of itself. It has the right spectrum. It has a lot of blue in the spectrum. It has also the right illuminance. So high illuminance, much higher than we use um, uh, typically with electric lighting. And um, uh, it's there at the right time, for, at least for day active people. Um, so uh, definitely a, a number of the effects that were reported in the literature um, will have been due to a better functioning of biological clock, better circadian rhythm, better sleep. But there were also a number of studies in this set that we reviewed that actually didn't have show this difference in uh, illuminance and didn't really uh, show more melanopsin activation. Um, sometimes it's hard to tell from the studies. A lot of these studies were, were also a little bit older and did not report exactly on the spectra, et cetera. But you can also, there's even a few uh, studies where we can directly see that it was not the amount of light that did it, but rather the fact that it was natural light, that it was daylight. And uh, so here, um, what may be the underlying mechanism behind those restorative effects may have been those associations with nature, them being natural, them being more positive, them bringing positive um, uh, mood and effects because we uh, prefer this, because we think it's healthy, um, because we connect it to being outdoors, maybe with leisure time, uh, maybe we think it's more beautiful, especially of course for sun patches. And um, so what we're saying is, if we're talking about good daylight and daylight indoors, we shouldn't only talk about the amount of light, but also look at the visual and psychological pathways that daylight, uh, through which daylight may have its, its restorative effects. And one example of such an effect is, is very clearly is, is in a, this daylight simulation study. So this is an artificial skylight. And the nice thing about these simulation studies, so some of them were simulation studies in a review. The nice thing here is that they can control for the amount of light falling onto the eye. So here the melanopsin activation was actually identical. Um, but still, um, the, the authors report quite positive effects um, uh, uh, on, on uh, uh, affective outcomes and physiological outcomes. So there was another class of uh, studies uh, where the findings were more mixed, um, with, but, uh, uh, although they still suggest very positive effects of light, sometimes neutral effects. And those two cases with negative effects were actually studies where participants were seated at the window, facing the window with sunlight falling directly on them. And they tried to do a reading, a task that involved reading. So then of course, shading is always a good option. Um, others, so the blue studies were studies like this, where for instance, facade design or opening characteristics were varied. Um, and with the exact same amount of light falling into the, the room, we saw more positive effects on physiology and on mood. For instance, in the lower left corner, if the patterns are perceived as more natural and uh, are more pleasant, then again, we see more positive effects in terms of restoration. So um, what we are doing currently is trying to find out more uh, with more, in more depth how we can design electric lights that is better for us. Um, uh, and, and we're trying to take inspiration from nature. So it's looking at the patterns, the double light patterns, for instance, movements of, of uh, light. And a question that is driving us at the moment is can we bring more more attractive electric light where daylight isn't available? Of course, the number one option is always design for daylight, bring it in because that's serving both your biological and your psychological needs. But if there's no availability of daylight deep inside buildings or in special buildings, maybe we can come closer to this feeling of daylight uh, through a good design. And we wonder, of course, does it need to look or feel real, or will we also be captured by something that looks like that that has a bit of the feel of natural light, but isn't really natural light? And uh, the question is, can we also use this to heal? So, um, uh, with this, I would like to conclude that please don't forget in your daylight designs uh, that it's not just about the amount of light and photons, but it's also about the image that the daylight creates and the associations we have with nature and with natural light 
that may uh, be very important for our mental health and our physical health. And I would like to thank these people who have been collaborating with me in this research, particularly Stephen Verte in the uh, Experiencing Sampling Study, and Ilka is doing all the hard work in the review. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yvonne, uh, for the interesting um, talk. Um, I would also like uh, to encourage our audience to ask questions in the Q&A tool. And we will now um, move to the next presentation by Johannes. <laughs> Hi, Johannes. Hello. I hear you. Yes, everything is working good. So yeah, please share your slides with us. And the floor is yours. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Aisha. Um, and also thanks to Yvonne for getting you all up to speed on the research part of things. Um, so I just share my screen. Maybe you can give me a quick uh, quick message if, if you can see it. Perfect. Yeah, okay. Um, so yeah, since Yvonne talked about the importance of daylight in the research context. I'm going to be here more in the context of an engineer and lighting designer for daylight. You wouldn't get it from my slides because they are much more boring than what Yvonne has. They were really great. I liked them a lot. Um, but we will stay in this notion that daylight is very important, not just for a visual, but also for a non-visual sense. And um, I'm trying to tackle how much daylight we get in buildings and how much we sensibly need to uh, at least reach certain stimuli, uh, stimulus levels for our non-visual pathway. And in the first part of my talk, basically, we will get into the theory of how to evaluate a building in this context before we then get into examples of daylight optimization later on. Let me start off by saying that Inside of buildings, we really get very little daylight and you can get a feeling for that yourself. If you've ever passed by a construction site before the windows are put in, you see those black holes, those black rectangles. And they are black because compared to what you are adapted to on the outside, there is just so little daylight inside and coming back out to your eyes. Once you go inside, obviously, uh, your non-visual system or your visual system will adapt, but your non-visual system can't adapt in the same way. So for the non-visual system, it's still kind of dark. And I want to emphasize that numerically. Um, here we see a graph of light stimuli over one whole day. Um, Yvonne talked about how the non-visual pathway has a special receptor, and we are still talking about um, light levels or lux in that content, but it's weighed a little bit different. But it's still, for daylight, you can basically think about it as illuminance. And this is taken from a sensor at the neckline, so it roughly represents uh, what I get as a light level at the eye. And it was taken about two weeks ago, and the special thing really about uh, this day is that besides breakfast, which happened around here, I was either outside, which you can see by those blue lines, or I was inside of a building which was exclusively daylit. So no artificial lighting here. And there are recommendations of what uh, light levels we should reach during the day. And you can see I'm clearly below, below that we are around 100 lux or less. And chances are, even if I had artificial lighting during those situations, I wouldn't have reached this level because that is what we see regularly in our built environment. Now, we, we have very little uh, daylight levels here, but it's not because the daylight was weak. And you can clearly see that once we rescale our graph to the portions of the day when I was outside. Those levels are low because only 0.2% of daylight outside reached my eye level inside. And this percentage of daylight on the inside compared to the outside is what we call a daylight factor. So what Yvonne talked about before, daylight factor, that's a different kind of daylight factor. Here it's more a proportion from the uh, light level inside to outside. And 
don't believe that this uh, 0 0.2 is atypically low. This is a systematic problem that we have in our buildings of very little daylight inside. And some people imagine building designs like this as the perfect solution to this. Glazed walls that lead to transparent and daylight flooded interior spaces. But those solutions are bad on so many levels, not least of which is that they don't resemble reality because the reality that you get is a black obelisk. And yeah, what you see on the right is the same building than on the left. The left is what was sold during a design competition, but the thermal envelope of a building, it mustn't lead to overheating. So the engineers for building physics, they will just go crazy and they will reduce the radiant transmittance of our glazing as much as possible. And this not only reduces the amount of daylight getting in, but also leads to spectral shifts in color and color rendering and might also affect the uh, potency of daylight in terms of uh, stimulating our non-visual path, not to speak of the heightened need for blinds and shades. No, we, we don't need dark towers, but we need smart decisions about what a building geometry should be, window openings, directions, um, finding optimal so solutions for, um, for all those aspects. And in order to design for our non-visual pathway of light, we need a way to evaluate a building's performance in that regard. And this evaluation really hinges on a relatively simple question, which is what percentage of the year do we reach a certain stimulus level, a threshold? And Let's use 250 lux M, uh, melanopic EDI because this is an established value. Uh, you could, of course, use another one, but let's stick with it for now. I also narrowed the time of the day that we are looking at down in the morning from 8 when work starts because we often design for work contexts until 11 o'clock in the morning because those first hours, they are very important for uh, synchronization. And this question for the outside is relatively simple to answer. If you look at the graph here, you see measurements for Munich for one year, and we have values uh, for zero up to over 100,000 lux. There are some hours during winter when the sun hasn't risen yet, so the answer to our question is not 100% for the outside, but it's quite high still. It's 92%, and this is what I would call a melanopic daylight autonomy. So autonomy through daylight for our non-visual pathway. But this is what you would only get if you suddenly decided to forego civilization like this guy and live on the field from now on. For everyone else who stays indoors, we need to calculate the melanopic daylight autonomy at the eye level inside. And we can use this measure to make design decisions according to our non-visual pathway. Now, to briefly touch on the subject of how much daylight we need for that, this melanopic daylight autonomy can be calculated several ways. You could simulate it, um, and one estimate can be made from the daylight factor that we mentioned before. You remember when I told you that only 0.2% of the outside illuminance reached my eye? Well, basically, this is the daylight factor. There are other things attached to it, but let's stay with it like, like that. And we can use it to define how much daylight roundabout we need in order to reach certain melanopic daylight autonomy levels. And you can see it's not an even spread. There are comparatively low levels here if you want to reach the first few percents of daylight autonomy. And then you, when you get to higher levels, you need more and more percentages. So you need to, to approach outside levels for those kind of, of daylight autonomy values. And let me give you an example of how this evaluation works in practice. Here is a project of ours in Munich. I chose it because it's a very standard building. Um, it could be residential. In this case, it's used as an office building. And we evaluated the daylight availability in different floors by building a virtual, virtual model and then calculated the melanopic daylight autonomy. And here we can see the results. And they are very common for dense urban areas with this kind of window facade. Uh, 
what you see here, regardless of the floor, you see very low levels of melanopic daylight autonomy. Um, I mean, there are some values above zero close to the window, but if you have a second workspace farther away from the window, there is just no time of the year when you reach sufficient levels. Levels somewhat increase as we get higher, first floor, third floor, fourth floor, but they, as I said, they are always low. So the default situation is not very good, um, so we want to optimize it. And let's get into two examples of daylight optimization. But before we do, I need to say a sentence or two about the design stage where optimization takes place. Because too often we come into a project where we are tasked with optimizing daylight, uh, but all the major decisions were already made. But because the biggest impact on daylight in buildings come from the geometry of the building itself, where are window openings? What dimensions do they have? What's the floor plan like? And too often this is decided upon before looking quantitatively at daylight distribution. And then you can only work on details, but lose out on the biggest optimization. In this example here, we were tasked with optimizing skylights um, in a multi-floor library for a university. And the engineers for building physics, they closed off most of the available glazing area for skylights because they were concerned that it would overheat down here. And in this case, we could convince the architects and clients to at least use the full opening of uh, the skylights um, for, in order to, for daylight to play any role at all. But this required a technical daylight solution. So it's, it's a mirror draster inside the glazing that cuts out the sun. And it's, a, it's really cool, but also very expensive. And it's a, a technical solution to a problem that should really have been solved without extra cost at an earlier stage. And let me show you a simple example of what I mean with that if you come in early. Here we have a very simple daylight situation in an industrial production site. It's not pretty and it will never be, but it's important because people are working here day and night. And we were tasked with designing an artificial lighting solution, which we won't go into in this presentation, but we were also asked how we would improve on the daylight situation should the roof, should the roof be renewed in a few years. And you can see here, there is some daylight here. Um, here is here is the, our analysis of the, the stock situation. 5% uh, of the roof are openings, and it's positioned on the crest above a traffic area. Here in this axis, our workers are positioned. So you can see this sad worker here doesn't get any kind of daylight autonomy at all. So um, just moving over the skylight to where the workers are, and spreading it out so that every worker along this axis can get to it uh, already imp improves on the daylight situation greatly. But it's still not optimal. Here you can see an almost optimal setting with 17% uh, roof opening, and it's opened lengthwise above the workplace. And this gives us almost 60% melanopic daylight autonomy for the worker. And then you could really say that those workplaces are now somewhat daylit and reach sufficient levels in summer and most of the time during spring and autumn. But how do I know that 17% is good? Why not 25% or 30% opening? Because it, it certainly would increase the daylight autonomy. And that's the beauty of coming in early because you can really look at the distribution of results for different roof openings and positions of uh, the, those openings and see where increasing the roof opening a little bit increases the daylight autonomy a lot. And that's the percentages that you have to fight for with these thermal engineer guys. And then you get almost like a break point, which is just an artifact of smoothing here, but the principle holds where if you increase the roof opening further, then you really don't get much more daylight autonomy. And this almost parametric design is open in early stages of a building design, and it helps to find satisfying conclusions with very little cost. 
In the second e example I want to show you, we come in from a late design stage. And it's from a high school that is built right now in Munich. You can see it from a bird's eye view here. It's a really big building that not only has facade facing windows and classrooms, but also has four inner courtyards here. And you can see the sections of the courtyards here. And those courtyards are really high. They are like 17 meters compared to five and a half meters in width. So there was some concern that the classrooms at the bottom of those uh, courtyards would not receive enough daylight. So we looked at them and I will share the results with one of them with you. Um, here you can see the base result. Um, and as we expected, <laughs> it, it doesn't look great. Those people that you see here, they are the main positions of the teachers in the room. And they are the ones we are concerned with most because uh, students, they leave those rooms after an hour or two, but those teachers are really going to stay here for decades. Um, in our starting posi position, they never reached a sufficient daylight stimulus, so we were tasked with optimizing the daylight availability. And the problem here is that all the major decisions had been made at those points. We cannot change the position of the atrium, nor can we change its dimensions or the layout of the floor. And in those cases, we can only go through all the surfaces one by one and think about how they could be used to improve daylight distribution. I mean, there are other solutions which we explored, but um, this is mostly true. And in some small details, you might be able to change geometric, um, ge geometry a bit, like in the height of the window lintel here or in getting a, a slope on the atrium floor or the courtyard floor here. Um, but mostly this is a game of material choices. And one of those I find particularly interesting because we decided to uh, print a pattern on those upper floor windows in order to increase the amount of light that comes down to the lower classrooms at the expense of those upper rooms. But those are not classrooms, they are traffic areas and they are closer to the uh, opening here. So that really changed a lot, even though it's a very expensive measure. Let's look at how those measures changed the daylight availability. You can really see how those small steps do add up to some pretty impressive changes. In the end, we have roughly three and a half times more light in the room compared to our starting design. And you could say that daylight now at least plays some role, but we are at a very low level of daylight autonomy still. So I, I would not call those rooms great, but they are not as bad as they started out with. For comparison's sake, we also looked at typical classrooms in the same building that were facade facing, and we didn't look at an optimization. And we were actually kind of shocked because those are classrooms being designed and built today, achieving every regulatory need, but failing at the basic supply of daylight really in a major way. And we have to do better. And I hope that Yvonne has convinced you that it should be done. And I've shown you that it can be done, preferably at an early stage in building design. Obviously, we can't provi provide sufficient daylight in every situation, especially in winter times. And in those cases, it makes sense to substitute daylight with artificial lighting. And while we don't have the time to get into the details in this talk, I want to show you an early solution of ours that has its 10th anniversary next year, and I believe still holds up quite well. It's the dynamic lighting for a carpentry workshop for people with, uh, with special needs, and it consists of two lighting components. And the first component is a more or less standard industrial luminaire that shines light directly downwards. It's very energy efficient and has a neutral white LED spectrum. And to this, we added an indirect component above, and this shines light into the sawtooth roof, which was originally wood in, in the surface, wooden surface. And we fought during the design phase to have those surfaces painted white because wood reflects the important blue part of the spectrum for our non-visual pathway poorly. And the white color thus dramatically increased the amount of daylight coming in. 
and also the reflected light from the indirect component. And what I particularly like about this solution is that it really plays with our expectations of light besides just reaching and um, partly arbitrary but recommended uh, stimulus level because the spectrum of the indirect component is very blue focused and we had to use a fluorescent light back then for cost reasons uh, but it could still be done today it, this one has over 10,000 kelvin and this is a very cool white color temperature similar to what you get in the sky without the sun and it's very similar to the daylight coming in through those northern skylights here and compared to that, the 4000 Kelvin LED light, which is neutral white, it looks very warm in comparison to the eye. And this is the same effect that the sun has in the sky. And all of this makes the design very pleasant on a subconscious level and adds to the positive effect of the added non-visual stimulus. Okay, so we've gone through a lot of things. Um, let's quickly summarize and wrap this up. Um, we started off by saying that the amount of daylight inside a building is but a fraction of the outside potential. And that depending on location and the relative amount of daylight that we get at a person's eye, daylight can be sufficient for over 90% of the year outdoors and realistically about 70% indoors. Indoor environments even today are not designed according to our non-visual needs and thus commonly only have sufficient stimuli in summer, sometimes not even that, as I showed you. Maximizing the glazed surface, however, is clearly the wrong direction. We need smart geometric and material choices and they are cheaper and better. We can optimize daylight in an early design stage in a huge manner and it's easy, cheap and very rewarding. In a later design stage, it's still possible and worth trying, but likely the measures are limited and might be costly. Daylight supplements are possible, but should always be added to a sound based design of daylight. We didn't have get time into multiple artificial lighting situations, but let me just say, obviously, they um, vary widely in technical complexity and there is no one size fits all. And lastly, um, it's just reiterating what Yvonne said, light has or daylight has more than physiological effects, the psychological or sometimes called emotional effects and visual effects always need to be considered as well. So for example, you could take this angle in the courtyard floor literally, or you can interpret it in a, a designed way like we did here with those mirrored um, spheres where you're not only redirecting light but also giving the students and teachers a view of the sky that they wouldn't have elsewhere okay so thanks a lot for staying with me even though i'm like two minutes over remember to go outside once in a while buildings can't do everything there are almost no wrong directions um, choose the right ones thank you very much Thank you very much, uh, Johannes uh, and Yvonne, uh, one more time. Um, we are joined by Kai, as said before, and I would like to open the panel discussion. Um, so again, I would encourage everyone to ask questions. We have only one that is unanswered, um, but I will start with, uh, to kick off the meeting with a question to um, Kai, just to also integrate him in the conversation and hear his voice. But please, please um, uh, enter your questions in the Q&A tool um, of the um, Zoom tool. So, um, Kai, <laughs> we heard from Yvonne uh, about uh, a lot about the scientific insights uh, of the visual uh, effects and 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 uh, psychological um, effects, and then uh, from Johannes about the design processes. Uh, now we know that uh, with uh, legislation, it's a bit um, more difficult or the time lag between um, the research um, outcomes and then integrating this into standards is sometimes long, especially when there is no uh, political urgency or priority. Um, so maybe you could 
highlight or just uh, talk to us about um, the activities that are um, ongoing in including this health aspects of daylight in the standards or directives. So I know that you know them very well on the German level, but maybe also on the international level. And of course, um, later on, Johannes and Ivonne are also invited to, to join <laughs> the conversation. Yeah, thanks, Aisha, for this question. Um, in uh, Germany, there are um, multiple efforts uh, going on in integrating um, health aspects and um, yeah, daylight into work directives or um, standardization um, issues like um, DEAN standards, um, like the German industry standards are called. Um, in um, the just published new version of the workplace directive um, there is um, there are some some uh, changes made um, already included and uh, priority for daylighting at workplaces was already given but um, now uh, at a very low level of a two percent daylight factor um, mm -hmm. Besides, but um, yeah, we heard a, a little bit about this in the presentations before. Um, but now um, they uh, went a step further and included the um, line of sight to the outdoor world uh, in this workplace directive. And um, I, I heard it was a um, big effort to get this into this um, law like um, paper. <laughs> So um, the steps are um, yeah tiny, but um, there they are, and um, I guess it's um, worth keeping on um, doing these efforts um, in um, by two two aspects. Um, for one, there's this health aspect, and on the other side, I guess um, we we can save energy and um, both aspects will save money for employers. So um, it should be uh, something to worry about. And um, um, yeah, on the other side in the um, German standardization um, Institute, um, there's work going on uh, in the uh, criteria for lighting design and integrating um, biological or health non-visual effects into um, the workplace lighting um, workplace lighting um, yeah uh, it's guidelines and not um, on a um, law level like the workplace directive because there are some stakeholders which don't want to have these uh, written down in standards um, but um, yeah, there's a lot of effort going on um, and in this uh, technical spe specification um, of the um, German Institute for Standardization, um, uh, there are some guidelines in integrating um, these health aspects into light lighting design. Um, and there's currently work going on in um, translating in into uh, an English version um, to start or um, yeah put more uh, effort in the international discussion and uh, to have maybe a back loop into the um, workplace directive in, in Germany, <laughs> I guess. So it's a, a slow process, um, but work is going on. Thank you. Um, maybe building on that, um, as we know, the, well, two effective ways to change things. One is through legislation, the other one is through education, maybe long-term. And there's also a question from Rebecca. Um, she says that as a lighting designer, she can uh, verify the frustration with not being involved, involved in early um, or early enough um, on to the impact uh, light, lighting, to impact the lighting decision, sorry. And what possible explanation um, can explain why architecture schools are not or have not embraced a focus on daylight harvesting with building orientations and floor plans? Um, so also, um, I think 
two questions. Oh, oh, the first one, uh, maybe I would start with Yvonne, as you are involved in the light cap, and also maybe a question if um, it should be mandatory in the training uh, of architects or urban planners. I mean, they have a lot of things that they already have to uh, learn and think about, and um, daylight would be then an additional thing. Um, but how how could we integrate it in the um, education or the, the the system, the training system? And then also to uh, Johannes, as he comes from this uh, field, so maybe. Yeah, he probably has a, a far more knowledge on this than I, because uh, I'm not in architecture, of course. But uh, indeed, education is 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 key, and uh, one would like to to make this obligatory in all. Uh, uh, um, course programs but of course there is a loss and particularly those cases where as Johannes also indicated sometimes there's a conflict between the thermal uh, aspects in a building and, and optimizing those and, and the light aspects um, education is key and I think it's not only it, it shouldn't be isolated just for architecture uh, departments I think if there's more awareness in the general public this will also automatically there will be a more strong call for for good daylighting in buildings and this will then also help raise the importance for for design and uh, so, so i think we should go both ways both in educating the general public um and uh, and, and trying to push this into architecture programs i know there are a, a few very good ones that actually do this but uh, um uh, with so with with the, the knowledge that we're gaining uh, and we're, we're talking a lot about integrative lighting this um, it does involve a, a, a lot of technology, a lot of psychology, a lot of biology. So it's not easy, but uh, um, education is key here. But I'm sure Johannes has uh, has a more clear view on what's happening in architecture programs. Um, I would say that architects have a very good implicit knowledge about daylight because, you know, they are coming from a design perspective and they are thinking about views and, um, and and directionality they are not that good in the explicit knowledge about daylight so the quantitative um, analysis of daylight and that comes back to bite them once the the engineers for the thermal design they are coming with the hard numbers and then it's shrinking uh, shrinking back uh, what you implicitly thought was was quite well and so i i obviously education is key here so that that at least there is the knowledge ingrained in in, in every architect even if he doesn't analyze it himself that he that he knows that he there are possibilities that there are ways to analyze it and hold something against um, other other um, aspects of of building physics uh, than uh, than the daylight part, and I think that's really key here because it I, it would be wrong to say that architects are are bad in this. They are they are not, but they are part of a, of a huge uh, design system where they they are. Cool coordinating so many different partners and so many different needs. And um, if there are so, those who are sensitive to that and they will include the partners um, who, who can, who can um, analyze that and then uh, it gets to a more balanced design, I think. Um, yeah, but I think it's not mandatory uh, right now in, in architecture to learn anything about quantitative daylight design. Um, so there is some work ahead of us, I guess. Yeah. But um, on, on the positive side, I mean, the, the um, Daylight Academy, um, they are doing so much stuff. To, uh, there are uh, things like 24 things about daylight, um, which are raising awareness. And I, I think once those things get rolling, it will get better and better in education. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Steve, and he's asking, "What is the?" And I saw that Johannes, you started to answer, so maybe in uh, real time, uh, what is the important wavelength range for simulating daylight with electric lights? Uh, the 380 to 780 uh, nanometers narrower range, or all wavelengths that get to the atmosphere? Um, 
Well, that really depends on what you're looking at. I mean, 380 to 780 nanometers, that's just the part of the spectrum which is visible to us. us. And obviously, if you're interested in the visual aspects or the melanopic aspects, because they work in the visual range as well, then this is the most important part. Going to UV, you really don't have to concern yourself on the inside because every glazing uh, is filtering that one out. Um, and then on the other side, you have the infrared part, which is very important for restorative um, effects. But um, I mean, this is the part that gets mostly cut out by the thermal engineer guys because it's the part that heats up the building. So for, for what I've talked about today, it's seven, uh, 380 to 780, basically. Can I add to this? Yes. Because uh, there are indications that indeed it's it's important. To, so it's, it's wonderful that already that you're talking about 380 to 780 and not just the part of the IPRTC uh, sensor, of course, because we want good light and pleasant light also. But there is actually a, a, a very important role for, for instance, UV light the, uh, for the vitamin D production. And uh, you can say, so we should be getting this outdoors perhaps, but if we go outdoors, we're typically uh, clothed. And uh, so we get very little of this of this daylight uh, of, of the UV factor. and. Indeed, our glazing and also our electric light are now um, uh, designed such that it that they do not give us UV light uh, for thermal reasons. For I don't know what uh, it's there are also also unhealthy aspects to UV light, but um, actually a small dosage of UV light is very important for us for our health uh, and uh, uh, so we should be perhaps also designing for this. And there are a few first studies on this. You can of course. Um, uh, instead, uh, um, take some medications for this, um, but but actually daylight is is best uh, for for uh, vitamin D production. And um, uh, similarly, some interesting studies in uh, um, infrared are being carried out, but for instance, by um, uh, uh, Marijke in in uh, in, uh, in the Netherlands, and she is. Uh, there are some first indications that this infrared may also serve very important biological uh, um, services. So we don't know. I think it's a little bit early days to change the regulations, but we should be aware that there's more than just the visible light uh, that is important for our health. Yeah. So maybe to add to this question, um, as you mentioned, we have um, different design or performance criteria, the visual ones and the non-image forming ones. And of, of course, we cannot um, forget the energy efficiency of our design. And um, sometimes they are in conflict with each other. How do we deal with that? Maybe it's a question that um, all of you could address uh, shortly. Um, and then we will move back to the questions from the audience. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's not an easy one. Yeah, it's, it's um, really not an easy one. I think we just have to make sure. Well, I, I'm a scientist, so I say uh, I believe in science. Let's find ways to better ways to, to to meet all needs and not just thermal needs, just not just the visual needs, not just the biological needs. We we'll try to to match and and energy and uh, sustainability are of course um, key, but uh, particularly if we're talking about daylight. Um, when you let daylight in, you need less electric light, right? So, so, uh, and then uh, I believe in science to solve the issues and the conflicts between thermal and uh, and daylight uh, adapts. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I I believe so too. Um, I mean, um, the electric lighting of, of a building can really have a, a big impact on the, the cost of a building in use. But if you look at the life cycle of a building, I think 80% of the cost are the people that are in there. And the most energy efficient building you could uh, build is one where nobody is and you put just the lights off. So it, it's function first, and then on top of that, make it as energy efficient as possible, I would say. Um, because we do need more light um, 
if we want to include those non-visual effects uh, in our artificial lighting. But if you have a good daylight design, you can save save much more, just as you once said. Yeah. It just has to be uh, not only designed well, but also implemented well, which is a common problem that, that I'm seeing in practice. Mm. Yeah, I agree with um, Johan what Johanna said and the one um, that um, energy efficient it should be, but um, the um, purpose of a building is first uh, to give the people that are working there or uh, living there uh, a healthy environment and um, and um, building what's uh, not healthy for the occupants is, uh, can't be energy efficient in that sense. So, mm. yeah. So um, this is a question that I think um, Yvonne uh, could answer uh, first. That um, it's about um, let's say the yeah that with respect to comfortable comfortable uh, light uh, we often um, indicate that contrast should be not too high. But in nature we uh, often have large contrast with shading, moving leaves, in, uh, inducing some uh, flicker, etc. Um, so why are we not bothered by those um, except in um, so in, in nature? And what is the difference between the contrast in natural light outdoors and indoors? So I think it's a question that is asked a lot. Uh, why do we um, yeah, accept more of the real thing <laughs> yeah. than we do with the electric light. Yeah, it's very true. There have been some very interesting studies also focusing on glare, for instance, and that we uh, we accept a lot more glare from, from outdoor, from sunlight, than we do from electric light. So I think this is part, th this part is, is, is very much tied to that subjective experience and that appreciation that we have uh, basically, there's a balancing game going on in our appreciation for daylight and sunlight, and uh, and 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 accepting a little more glare um, in in favor of, of of still having that. And there's a lot of frustration often with um, uh, blinds going down automatically when the index says that there's a uh, too much glare or too much con uh, the wrong contrast. Um, so so there's a part of this is subjective. At the same time, the, the contrasts we see in nature, I, I, they're beautiful. They are actually the, the, some of the wonder and the magic of, of, of the, the, the light uh, outdoors. But it may also be related to tasks. So for instance, when I'm in my garden, I'm enjoying the sun and the contrast uh, that, that the, sh the shade and the sun are giving. But as soon as I try to read a paper or a book in, that, uh, in, in those conditions, I, I get frustrated. So it may also be in related to tasks that we're doing uh, in the different contexts. So it's not always easy to, so, I, um, and as soon as we, for instance, try to raise light levels indoors, even to a thousand bucks, which is nothing if you're outdoors, people are starting to squint. And so we have to be really sensitive also to our expectations, our appreciation, and the fact that we cannot one-to-one um, -one transpose what we have, transplant what we have outdoors to indoors. That may not always work. Um, also with when we're trying to simulate daylight. So I don't think we have to go to those contrast levels necessarily, but there are a lot of different mechanisms going on in this appreciation. But it's definitely an established fact that we are less, far less uh, sensitive, or should I say far less bothered by sharp contrasts and glare from daylight, just to illustrate that appreciation that we have for it, I think. Thank you. Um, yes. Uh, would you like to add something, Johannes or Kai, or should we move to the next question, maybe? Because uh, we have only 12 minutes left. <laughs> so maybe just there's a step. Yes. Very, very briefly uh, say that I can't say why it is, but um, Jan Wienold has done a lot of work in that context uh, with the daylight glare probability. Um, and the fact that you see that there is a need for a different mathematical um, formulation for daylight glare than for the other kind of glare really is a testament to how different we seem to perceive it, even though it's for the same 
office task uh, that we are that we, we are designing for. But yeah, I, I have nothing to add on why it could be because Yvonne already uh, elaborated on that. Um, then the next question would be on the variability of daylight that we see in intensity and contrast and spectra. Uh, we have diffuse and um, directional lighting, um, which then creates different uh, lighting atmospheres. And um, the question is, wouldn't mimicking daylight involve a different um, thought of indoor luminar systems and control as a translation of these atmospheric um, qualities into architectural lighting luminous. Um, right. And then um, Veronica says, thank you for elaborating on that, um, respecting, in example, existing studies like double uh, focus lighting. So it's maybe a question that could be tackled by um, Johannes. Um, First. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, it certainly would. Um, would be a different approach than what you get um, from standard li lighting design, but um, there are, I think, different levels because if, if you get a very basic lighting design, it's always very focused on just reaching thresholds on surfaces uh, for your task. And this is, in, in all cases, it's far removed from what you uh, would design for uh, in, in a pleasant atmosphere because then you have to think about luminances and how they are distributed and I think then you you always come back to the natural order of things because that's what what we expect and seems to give us some kind of comfort so I I would say it's always um, a topic it's only often it isn't addressed yeah mm. As, but but I, I very much agree with this question that it's it's uh, when, when we think of mimicking daylight, if we really want to do it well, we have to take into account so many issues, not just the illuminance levels, but the spectral differences, the spatial differences, temporal differences, mm. perhaps even in, indeed the control. So um, uh, it, it is quite a puzzle. It's definitely not uh, uh, raising just illuminance levels in our uh, mm -hmm. ceiling. Uh, <laughs> ceiling mounted uh, luminaires that's not going to be uh, the solution so yeah. yeah um so regarding energy regulations we focus on efficacy which which has a photometric bias what do you think about using efficiency ratio of op optical watts to electrical watts over the wavelength range of interest so maybe a question that could be answered by Kai. I don't know if this is in your... <laughs> I think especially in Germany, we see this um, also that the energy or engineering uh, decision makers have uh, much more power, not only in uh, design, but also in funding. <laughs> um, so how do, we, how do we overrule this and how do we move more to a human set that focus, maybe this is more easy to answer, or I don't know if it is. <laughs> um, yeah, what, what to say? Um, I, hmm, I guess, um, yeah, can, can you repeat <laughs> the point? Um, <laughs> Yeah, it was. I... If if I may jump in, um, I have seen some suggestions for um, energy efficiency in terms of non-visual design, but uh, they all have one problem, and that is that depending on the time of day, um, you really have a different understanding of um, energy efficiency. So. In, in during the day, you might want to emphasize on the blue part of the spectrum, but that's exactly what you don't want for evening light. So um, it, it, energy efficiency is always what you want to have, depending on how much you have to spend for it. And what you want to have it, it depends on the time of day. And I, I, I think about it, but I, I'm not sure how this can be implemented in, a, in an efficacy value. 
Yeah. Yeah, another problem that we are facing is that um, there is a lot of unknown still, um, especially when we address the non-image forming um, effects. And the question is how can we deal with this known unknown uh, in the design process uh, or, or also in the st standardization? No? Like how can we overcome that or what to do with it? Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if uh, you, Johannes, could elaborate on that. Um, how do we deal with the unknown in the design? Well, I, I mean, design always needs to deal with that by just stating something, because in the end, you, you have to make a decision. And uh, it's it has to be a decision to the best of your knowledge and to to uh, that addresses or balances all the needs that you're aware of. And um, I mean, I think the best you can do with those unknowns is to at least document well, because as I, I've shown the example of the carpentry workshop that was done 10 years ago, we, we didn't have uh, melanopic EDIs, so the non-visual stimulus calculation uh, back then, but at least we documented uh, all the light spectra and so we can recalculate what is happening there then the standards change and then you can evaluate your design again and say is it still okay or do we need to change something and i think that's key with dealing with the unknowns to at least document very well then we have a question by bogdan if you can be exposed too much to light inside or outside to badly affect melanopic effects mm -hmm. I think this is a question yeah that can be answered uh, uh, yes you, you can be you, you can be uh, uh, exposed to too much uh, too much light particularly if it's at the wrong time so so really what we're when we're telling the story about light and circadian light circadian effects then we really should be talking about darkness as much as about light so as johannes just also uh, uh, stated um, good light is about sufficient light during the day and sufficient darkness during the evening. So during the day, I don't think we will easily go above what we would get outdoors uh, with any lighting uh, solution. Um, uh, so I don't think the risk there is to, to have too much melanopic light, except when you're using it at the wrong time. And of course, with that's quite a large population that's not working nine to five jobs. So it, it may be complicated in, in public buildings and in, in larger buildings, but in general, I don't think with melanopic, in terms of melanopic activation, we can go too high indoors or we'll easily go too high. That's different, of course, for UV light. Yeah. Um, so maybe one more question for the um, facade. Um, I think it's uh, for Johannes. Uh, could you please share your views uh, of how facets with different colored glazing or with PV panels affect daylight optimization for melanopic daylight autonomy? So I guess this uh, question says we are not dealing with the size of windows, but just what uh, glazing is used in, in the window. Um, most of the time, you don't really Care because most glazings in, in our everyday lives is melanopically speaking very equally on the visual and the melanopic side. So uh, transparency is not very uh, different. And that changes once you get to those examples I showed you with the high rise, um, because then the non visible or the parts of the spectrum that we are not that sensitive to like the the green yellow orangey part of the spectrum they are trying to uh, keep that maximally high but then cut off to the left and to the right and that's obviously um bad but not only melanopically uh, it's it's just bad in terms of color rendering and if you see those kind of glass inside and especially then there is a window open and you can see the sky and how it really looks well that's a bad situation and uh, but that's more on the uh, the psychological front i would say yeah thank you we have two minutes left so just like to mention that um 
all the talks and also the panel discussion is recorded and it will be accessible and all the persons that were registered will um, get an email which will include the link um, to the recordings. And also I would really uh, like um, to encourage you to take part in the survey. Maybe one final question uh, to all um, the participants in the uh, panel. Um, can we uh, simulate daylight and is daylight as effective or, or simulated daylight as effective uh, uh, as um, the real, real daylight? Um, especially for these uh, physiological effects um, that Yvonne mentioned in her um, um, uh, lecture, but also for the non-image forming effects. Um, maybe we could start with, yeah, with Yvonne and then, uh, or, or first with Kai, because yeah, I think it was very much focused on the presentations from Yvonne and, and Johannes. Yeah, it's all right, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> of course. <laughs> um... Oh yeah, it, it's a big question. Uh, if we can, um, yeah, artificially create a daylight, um, and I guess or I know it's uh, still under investigation. <laughs> um, I would say, um, yeah, it could be possible, but um, or it maybe will be possible some. How? But um, first, we have to know what makes daylight to daylight. And um, this is a question um, which I know is um, under investigation um, and at many places, but also at the ETU in Berlin. And um, um, yeah, if, if we want to create daylight like it's there, um, it should be possible. I guess, but um, maybe it's more important to recreate these parts of daylight which we want to have. But first, we have to know what we want. <laughs> so it's a question of science for the next decades. Yeah. With that, maybe to Yvonne. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I, I very much agree with Kai. It would be wonderful if we could recreate it, but I think. An, from an energetic perspective, that would not be very interesting. We have yeah. brilliant daylight outdoors. So, uh, but indeed, if we know which aspects of daylight are important, is it the spatial play? Is it the temporal play? Is it the part, specific part of the spectrum? Is it uh, as soon as we, so the better we understand this, the better we can take the essence of what is daylight mm. to places where real daylight cannot enter. But uh, actually, let's first start with what we have out there. And then, so I, I'd love to have a tool like that for my lab and turn off and, and, and on certain uh, parts. Um, but, uh, uh, but we have to also be, uh, be wise here and, and realize that there are multiple goals that we're trying to, to serve here. So I don't think exactly mimicking is, will, will be key to, to healthy buildings. I think there are more important parts there. Yeah. So we have one minute left, uh, Johannes. <laughs> okay, I, I'll try to be quick. Um, I very much agree with uh, Yvonne and Kai, um, but I'm cautious in the sense that um, once we open the door and say, oh yeah, we can do artificial lighting like it's daylight, then maybe daylight design will get even worse <laughs> because you know, people will just say, okay, we can supplement it, no, no worries. <laughs> And and really, if you if you see good daylight design, it's it's just so good, and I can't imagine that you can mimic it in in all um, in in all details in the foreseeable future, at least. And um, really, I, I mean, I've seen examples of of artificial daylight on a visual sense that is so good. I I know it's fake, but I I can't bring my brain to acknowledge it. Um, but there are the other aspects and the unknowns that you mentioned, and we, we really shouldn't ignore them just by saying that we don't know about them. So we can just substitute the daylight uh, artificial lighting one to one. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Yvonne. Thank you, Johannes. And thank you, Kai, for participating today and um, for giving um, the talks and also discussing uh, daylight uh, on the International Day of Light.
Uh, also, uh, thank you to the host for facilita facilitating this and uh, for the daylight talks um, to, yeah, to have us here and to um, have this conversation ongoing uh, on daylight. Thank you very much to everyone also participating online. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank thanks. you very much. Yeah, thanks, Aisha, for the great moderation. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>